Welcome. Thank you for being here in Spruance Auditorium. Uh, I would like to remind you to remove your badges and put your cell phones on silent or off, please. And to introduce our guest speaker, I would like to welcome Professor Jackson to the stage. Any of my elective students out there, you better be cheering and applauding, so. Okay. That's, that's better. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Professor John Jackson, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our guest speaker today. While I don't want to take too much time away from our speaker, I've been asked to take a few minutes to provide a little information about the events leading up to the capture of Porter Halliburton to speak briefly about the treatment of POWs in general during the Vietnam War, and then I'll turn our session over to a man I greatly admire. First, I ask each of you to think back to where you were and what you were doing on January 2nd of 2017 and the weeks following. Let me spark a few memories. The Golden Globe for the best picture was La La Land. Clemson beat Alabama in the college football national championships. President Barack Obama awarded Joe Biden the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Technology startup SpaceX accomplished the first ever recovery of a Falcon 9 rocket on a drone ship in the Atlantic. And two days ago, they did it again for the 300th time. On 20 January 2017, Donald Trump was inaugurated as the 45th President of the United States. And finally, in late November, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle announced their engagement. Well, January 2nd, 2017 is exactly 2,675 days ago, which is the period of time Porter spent in the prisons of North Vietnam. Seven years, three months, and 28 days. It has been 58 and a half years, almost six decades, sorry, Porter, since Lieutenant Junior Grade Porter Halliburton and his pilot, Lieutenant Commander Stan Olmsted, climbed into their F-4B Phantom fighter bomber and launched on 17 October 1965 on a mission over North Vietnam. This was Porter's 75th combat mission of the war and it would prove to be his last. During a low altitude run 40 miles north of Hanoi, the plane encountered heavy ground fire and took a direct hit in the cockpit from a 37 millimeter anti-aircraft shell. Recognizing that the plane had been critically damaged and the pilot killed, Porter ejected from the stricken aircraft. He was soon captured by Vietnamese villagers and at the age of 24, became the 40th American flyer to be taken prisoner in North Vietnam. Since no other aviators on the raid saw a parachute, it was assumed that there were no survivors and Porter was classified as killed in action. To help visualize the events and conditions which followed, we will display a series of pictures, drawings from a book from a uh, former POW himself, Lieutenant Commander Mike McGrath, and his book, Prisoner of War. It was originally published in 1975 by the U.S. Naval Institute. Once Porter ejected from his stricken aircraft, he was quickly captured by local peasants and militia, and within days he had been transported to the Wallo prison, which ultimately came to be known as the Hanoi Hilton. Thus began his seven and a half year ordeal. Mike McGrath drew pictures of their accommodations, but more revealing are these photos of the actual cell in which Porter was held, one of the many cells in which he was held. The prisoners were kept in austere conditions, often shackled in leg irons and handcuffs for weeks or months at a time. When not locked down, they were subjected to brutal treatment from abusive guards who took great pleasure in their suffering. Most vicious of all were the professional interrogators who were given pet names by the prisoners. With total disregard for the provisions of the Geneva Convention, these interrogators used various forms of punishment and physical torture to force information and statements from the POW. Many were forced to kneel on rocks and other sharp objects for hours or even days on end. By far the most common method of torture was what the POWs came to call the rope trick. 
They were tightly bound in painful positions, which often pulled arms out of sockets and left many permanent injuries. Punishment was routinely given for violations of camp rules. This punishment included beatings with leather straps and countless painful hours in shackles. Communication of any time between prisoners was forbidden, but resourceful POWs maintained contact with them, one another by various clandestine means, including writing notes on scraps of stolen paper, the now famous TAP code, and the POW devised mute code, which was used to communicate when visual contact could be made. From 1964 through 1969, most prisoners were kept in solitary confinement or in very small groups, but several events, including the attempted rescue raid on the Sante prison, caused a significant improvement in tre treatment and conditions. Over time, increasing pressure from, to improve conditions was brought to bear by the U.S. government, as well as individuals such as H. Ross Perot and organizations such as the National League of Families of POWs and MIAs in Southeast Asia, which was founded by Sybil Stockdale, the wife of former Naval War College President James Bond Stockdale. Porter's wife, Marty, who's with us today, was active in the National League as the coordinator for the 10 Southern states. Public support was shown in many ways, and some in this audience may have worn POW bracelets, such as this one, which uh, is engraved Lieutenant Porter Halliburton, 10 the date of his shoot down. From 1970 on, most prisoners were held in larger cells in the Hanoi Hilton, each holding up to 40 prisoners. Their conditions were still meager and crowded, but far better than before. After over 10 years of war and nearly five years of negotiations, the Paris Peace Accords were signed in January of 1973, and the POWs began to be released in February. Shown here is Lieutenant Commander Halliburton about to board the C-141 in Hanoi, finally on his way to freedom. The remarkable story of Porter and Air Force POW Fred Cherry was told in the book, Two Souls Indivisible, the friendship that saved two POWs in Vietnam. In February 2016, Colonel Cherry passed away. Dr. Halliburton served as a professor at the Naval War College from 1979 until his retirement in 2006 and now holds Professor Emeritus status. I will leave it up to Porter to speak to this final image. Please welcome Commander Porter Halliburton back to the Naval War College. Thank you uh, so much. It's always wonderful to be back at this wonderful institution and uh, so see so many uh, students here. I hope you are reading all the books you are assigned. <laughs> this is a unique opportunity to take a break from uh, warfare and other activities and uh, nourish, your, nourish your minds. This is a wonderful opportunity to do this. Um, I look at this uh, tombstone for I was declared killed in action and my mother uh, had a tombstone put in our, uh, in our uh, family plot in Davidson, North Carolina. And asked about it, I, uh, I said, well, having your own tombstone has its benefits. If the conversation at a cocktail party kind of uh, falls off, you can always go out and look at the tombstone. <laughs> and I'm asked about it and uh, the best thing is to be able to look down on it instead of up. So I will talk more about that uh, as we go along. Um, anyway, I uh, don't, you saw something about our conditions. Uh, Professor Jackson showed Mike McGrath's uh, uh, drawings and we're fortunate to have Mike's drawings because they they are the visual aspects of, um, of our experience. Um, 
So uh, I don't want to deal with that because to me, that's not the important thing. These events were terrible. They were difficult. They have, uh, but what I want to talk about is how we dealt with them. Because the lessons that you learn from experience is the important thing about that experience. It's the only reason that I want to talk about it at all is because of what we learned. What I learned, what others learned, what the War College had learned about uh, difficult uh, kinds of war and so on. So uh, as you saw, you know, the features of, of uh, what was shown there, brutality and boredom, isolation, uh, central features of our experience. And, and you, the, the Vietnamese wanted to keep us as isolated as they possibly could because they knew that if we got together, we would organize into a military unit and we would resist there would be resistance, and that's what they wanted to stop. And so we were kept as isolated as possible. They couldn't keep everybody in a separate cell because they just didn't have the room. And so over time, groups did get bigger, uh, but uh, they always forbade uh, any communication, and it was very, punishment was severe for it. But it was the one thing that we had to do. And if you think about leadership, and I'll talk about leaders, our senior leaders, our mid-grade leaders, our junior leaders. Uh, leadership means absolutely nothing if you can't communicate and if you can't communicate well. And so communication became the most important thing that we did in order to organize, in order to survive, to help each other, and so on. And so that's what I want to talk about uh, more here than anything else. And so I've kind of divided things up into threes. I want to talk about three different time periods, three different uh, periods of adaptation to our environment, uh, three reflections that I'd like to make, and three important things. So the time periods, I would say the first one was from 1964 when Everett Alvarez was shot down right after uh, the Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident. And uh, the central features of that time was uh, were building of leadership and communication, uh, adaptation to our environment, and we found that you can, you can adapt to almost anything. You can get used to the worst of circumstances if you have the will to do so and if you have the time. And so this period was a period of adjustment and extremely hard choices. We were, of course, I'd been to Sear School like everybody else and taught at the time, name, rank, service number, nothing else, period. And so most of us were trying to abide by that. And we found over time, obviously, that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't live that way. But at first, we tried to do that. And I was sticking to the code of conduct and um, refusing to answer questions. I, in thinking about this, one other thing, uh, I was offered the chance to write a letter and uh, I eventually turned it down because they wanted an address. And that wasn't something, I said, I'll just send it to the United States. They'll get it. Uh, no, that wouldn't do. And so I did not write a letter and uh, I was declared killed in action. And I just wonder now if that strict adherence to that would have saved Marty and uh, my family you know, the grief of, of, my, of my death. But anyway, so uh, after I was in that cell that you saw that uh, Professor Jackson showed uh, for about two weeks, uh, interrogations every day, beatings and whatever, um, I was given an uh, ultimatum. You either talk to us, and if you do, we'll move you to a better place. If you don't, if you continue to refuse, we'll move you to a worse place. Well, you saw that little cell. I couldn't imagine a worse place than that. 
So I said no, and I moved to a worse place. <laughs> that wasn't worse in terms of the physical condition so much. Uh, this happened three more times, about every 10 days or two weeks or so. I was given this choice, better place, worse place. And each time I chose the worst place. And each time it got harder because each place was worse in its own way. And the last two places that I was involved isolation, cut off completely from any communication with anybody else. And I can tell you that isolation is different than solitary confinement. You can deal with solitary confinement because you can tap on the wall, you can communicate with others. Isolation you cannot, and that does strange things to your mind. I've, I had friends uh, who were tortured many times, who spent years in isolation, and they said, given a choice, isolation or torture, I'd take torture. So that gives you an idea of how how difficult isolation is. And so towards the end, I was isolated. I began to have these things work on my mind. Uh, physically, I was deteriorating. I was sick. I couldn't eat. Uh, I was at the end of my rope and yet given another choice. And it was the hardest decision I ever made to say no again. And so it was then that I was moved up to another cell. They opened the door, they pushed me inside. They said, you must care for Cherry. And he was a black Air Force officer. Why he couldn't have been Navy, I don't know. It just, you know, <laughs> Air Force, my God. <laughs> so anyway, um, Fred, Fred, 105 pilot, uh, he was hit low level, going very fast, five, six hundred miles an hour, and was hit, and his cockpit filled up with smoke, and he had to clear that smoke. He blew the canopy, but he didn't get his arm back in, and the slipstream just about ripped his arm off his body. He had many other injuries as well, couldn't do anything for himself, and so I was told to wait on him, be his servant, care for him, all of that. They thought that for a young Southern white boy that would be the worst thing they could do. It was the best thing they could do because the change in my attitude about everything was dramatic. Up until that time, I had been concerned with just a few things, staying alive, staying healthy, doing my duty, getting home. That was about it. Now I had something important to do, and that was to help this man survive. It gave a meaning to my life that I had, did not have before. And so uh, it changed my whole attitude about uh, captivity, our survival, what we had to do to help each other. I realized that we're in this together. We have to help each other. We can never let anybody fall through the cracks, feel alone, feel neglected. We have to do whatever we can to make sure everybody comes into this network that we are building during this time. Collecting names and information about everybody who was there, memorizing these things in case we had a chance to, to get this information out. And so this was, this is kind of what happened uh, during this, uh, during this time. In, um, in the summer of 1966, uh, we bombed Hanoi for the first time. Uh, we'd been bombing south of that prior to this time, but we bombed their POL storage, wiped, wiped it out completely in, within the confines of Hanoi. And that really irritated them. And they decided they were going to take it out on us. They were going to make an example. They were going to show their rage and all of this and to uh, characterize us as uh, war criminals. They threatened to put us on trial uh, for war crimes and execute. 
Well, President Johnson uh, at the time did, <laughs> he said, if you do that, I'm taking the B-52s and sending them over there and I'm going to level Hanoi. So they backed off on that. They didn't put us on trial, but it began the most difficult period of our captivity in which uh, they had been trying to get uh, various statements, very anti-war statements and other kinds of information from us and been largely unsuccessful. Uh, the stuff that they got uh, was unusable, used most, mostly, because they didn't speak English. They, they spoke English, but not American. So we could actually give them verbally the finger anytime they took a picture, you know, we were doing. So it was all, all resistance. And uh, so they decided uh, uh, that they were gonna change their policy, that they were going to use the ultimate force, as you saw the rope trick, uh, to get what they wanted. And so uh, this next period was 1966 to 1969. Uh, started with the Hanoi March, if you uh, ever saw any images of that. Uh, uh, and um, it was the most brutal time. Um, Fred, Cherry, and I, after eight months together, were, were taken apart. And he had nearly died several times from infection and mistreatment and everything. He says I, I saved his life, but he certainly saved mine by changing my attitude about things. And for being such a, I mean, he's the most patriotic guy I have ever known. And in despite of the fact that he'd grown up in a racist and segregated South, um, but he was, he, he was an amazing guy. And I learned so much from Fred. And it was such a privilege to, to be with him. We both cried when, uh, when, we were, when we were split up. And I went out to a very, very bad prison out in the country. Um, but we found during this time uh, that was so difficult that common suffering brings you together in a way that nothing else does. Viktor Frankl, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, if you, if you haven't read this book, read it. I'm, I don't know if it's part of the curriculum here, but maybe it should be. He was in Auschwitz and uh, he was a psychoanalyst and so on. And he wrote a book about it, Man's Search for Meaning, talking about his experience and uh, his theory of logotherapy. Uh, and he said, you know, man's most basic need is to discover the meaning in their life. And if you fail to find a meaningful life or a meaning in everyday life, you turn to other things, you know, pleasure and wealth and uh, all kinds of things that may or may not bring you uh, happiness and so on. But this search for meaning is what we are all about. And so I think that we, uh, during, and he said the best way to discover this is through suffering. And we did plenty of that. And so I think that during this time, we learned a great deal about ourselves and about others. And uh, so um, this was a very difficult time. Uh, in 1960, uh, let, me, let me read. I, one of the things that I did was to write uh, poetry. I it was an English major and uh, I had written poetry before, and uh, so uh, I turned to that. Of course, I'm I'm uh, I'm memorizing it. We couldn't write anything down, and so this is uh, the one of the poems I wrote, trying to express how I felt about my experience, and it's called "Reflections of on Captivity," which is the origin of. Uh, this <laughs> book. How can I measure the loss of my dimensions as I lie spread across this crass expanse of time? Bitter years devoid of latitude or luster. My duty days of trial and decision. Arbit pages turned, but pages not forgotten. 
Those countless hours of aimless retrospection, regret, restraint, and introspection, the strange monotony of unrewarded hopes, unconquered hopes amidst my unborn tears have tempered the metal of my structure and filled the empty spaces of my soul. So that was an attempt to describe sort of the process that we were going through uh, during that time. Ho Chi Minh um, conveniently died in October of 1969. And I think by 1969, uh, the Vietnamese were beginning to realize that what they were doing using torture and mistreatment and violations of the Geneva Conventions was now well known in the world because of publicity about it. You remember uh, Jerry, Denton, uh, Jerry Denton blinking the word torture in an interview. That was the first concrete intelligence that came out of Hanoi that we were being tortured. The next was Stockdale in a letter using <clears throat> invisible carbon paper. It's a long story. You can read about it in Love and War, uh, their Jim and Sybil Stockdale's book. Uh, in there, he described that we were being tortured. And in that same letter, my name was there. And that's the intelligence that got out that resulted in my change in status from killed in action to POW, along with two other Navy flyers and so on. So anyway, Stockdale was the, uh, was the spy in that case. Um, and so the whole Vietnamese strategy, their overall strategy, they knew they were not going to beat us militarily. So their strategy was different. And of course, as you learn here, you attack an enemy's uh, strategic point, the weak point, the, the, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, they figured out that uh, our strategic point was the American public's willingness to support the war. And that's what they wanted to attack. And so in order to make that work, they had to generate propaganda to generate anti-war sentiment among the American public and the world at large and uh, simply not lose. Now, not losing was very expensive for them because, uh, you know, two, two million Vietnamese died during that war, but they hung on. They did not lose. We could not, we could not defeat them in a traditional way. And so uh, they figured that uh, sooner or later we would lose support for the war and we'd have to go home. There's a short history of the Vietnam War. We got tired of it, it was too expensive. We lost support, we went home. So that was their objective and that's why they, that's why they won. Um, and so um, the next period from 1970 until the end, until 73, there was a great change in our treatment. Uh, they realized that they wanted us, when we went home, to look as good as we could. Uh, and so uh, the food got somewhat better, some more of it. They began to allow packages to come from home that had vitamin pills and uh, other supplements and all kinds of things. Uh, Marty, Marty and I did not correspond, and correspond uh, at all for five years. And I finally got a package from her, it's supposed to be like 2.2 pounds, you know, shoebox uh, full of stuff. I got a roll of, I can't remember if it was a roll of Lifesavers or, or chewing gum, a pair of red socks, and four pictures. And I wish I could show you the picture of Marty and our daughter, Dabney. Dabney was five days old when I last saw her. 
And so here was a picture of her about four years old. The first image that I had of her and of, uh, and of Marty. Uh, and so I didn't care about any of the rest of that stuff, but these pictures became the most precious things that I had. Um, it was a visual connection with my previous life. And so um, we, um, because of this, this change in treatment, they actually built a, a prison that was designed to hold all of us in compound situations, about 60 people in a compound. Uh, and uh, it was very, very different than anything we had ever been in before. And we had room to, to do things. We could, you know, we could make coffee. We could, you know, all kind. It was very, very different. Before it was ever filled up, though, the Sante raid occurred. And they whisked us back to Hanoi, back into the very large cells in Hualo, 40 or 50 people in one cell. That eventually kind of settled out to about 40. Uh, but here we were, jammed in 40, uh, and you saw a picture of the big room there. It didn't look like many people were there, but there were 40 people in there. But you can imagine the environment that we had because uh, like if you, uh, Fred and I lived together, we tried to uh, teach each other what we knew about anything. And I, I, uh, I had taken Spanish, I didn't know very much Spanish, I didn't remember much Spanish because I hadn't used it. And I really wanted to learn German. And Fred said, oh, I took German in college. And I said, ah, oh, great. He knew less German than I knew Spanish. <laughs> But I did get a few words, you know, from him and so on. And uh, anyway, it became my objective to, to learn German. And now we're in this big group. And, and so I was, some people spoke pretty good German. And so it became, uh, one of my objectives was to, to, to learn German. And uh, eventually the Vietnamese gave us a uh, kind of a little notebook and I turned it into what we called a trilingual dictionary, but it was actually a quadrilingual dictionary. It had English, uh, German, Spanish, and French. And we had lists of the words and, and all their equivalents and everything. And I actually brought that home. I believe, I believe it's in the War College Museum, that trilingual dictionary. Anyway, I, I, I learned German, and, uh, but we didn't have a dictionary aside from our homemade one. And so, you know, German is kind of wonderful the way they put words together. And so if we didn't know a word for something, we just made one up. <laughs> and so a rabbit became a hippin' hopper, and a duck was a swimming quacking. And we had uh, others, you know, and so we just used these words uh, right along with everything else. And so when I came back, um, I wanted to go to graduate school, and so I decided I would take a couple of undergraduate courses just to get in tune for graduate school. And I, I said I wanted to take German. So my advisor said, why don't you, he, he found out I'd learned some German, and why don't you take the equivalency test? I passed first year German based on my Hanoi experience. And this is just an example of the kind of thing that we were able to accomplish with almost nothing. Uh, people were learning Russian, German, Spanish, uh, everything. People were, we, I made a slide rule with, uh, with some friends. Uh, we learned to play music, piano, guitar. Uh, I, I wrote music. Um, I, and we just did so many wonderful things without much at all. And so the more we did, the more we understood uh, what we could do. And so this was a wonderful period of uh, uh, being all together. and. Um, and uh, and we had, uh, oh, I'll talk about that later. 
Okay, now, let me talk about three adaptations. And the first one I would call retrospection. And I, it was during this early period when I mostly lived in my past. I thought about my past life, the good things about it, and, uh, and the bad things, the things I'd done wrong, opportunities I'd missed, and so on. And in, in that poem, you know, the regret and introspection and so on, that's what that was really about. And so it was a way to sort of escape for a while, mentally anyway, uh, a very difficult present. So I was living in the past to avoid the present as much as I could. The first poem um, that, I, that I wrote maybe illustrates uh, how, how optimistic we were and how unrealistic we were uh, about the way the war was going. This was during a period when the most pessimistic POW thought we'd be there for two years. Most of us, you know, thought we'd be out in a year. Vietnamese won't be able to resist what we're doing and so on. Of course, we were really wrong about that. This is called Winter Crypt. How can I describe the way that I feel? As if the stream I was crossing had suddenly frozen and locked my ankles in an icy grip, immobilizing that once fluid force and I with it. And we have nothing to do but wait until the thaw. Well, obviously we had a great deal to do uh, rather than just wait. And so that was what uh, I think propelled us uh, we built a very strong military organization. We built a very strong social organization. I would say by the end, uh, what we had there was a sub-American culture, pretty conservative, uh, because all of us were, were officers with just a few exceptions, all pretty well educated, all were very patriotic, all volunteers and so on, and so we were a somewhat homogeneous group, and because of that, we could come together in a way that, say, prisoners in, in Korea could not. And we, saw, we survived in a different way than, than those prisoners did. And so uh, it was, it was uh, this, this environment that we had come to adapt to the environment and to make the best of it. And I think that's the, that's the important thing. I'll call the second period uh, Dreams and Plans. And uh, I, th I think I, uh, I had, uh, <laughs> during my retrospection, I, I uh, realized how much time I'd waste, people I'd hurt, things I'd done that were wrong. How am I going to atone? How am I going to make up for this? How am I going to live my life in a way that <clears throat> tries to recover some of this? And so I lived in the future. What's life going to be like? What are all the things I'm interested in doing? So I made a list and it grew over time. And I arranged these areas of interest alphabetically. And I had them in sort of a mental drawer. Everything was in a mental drawer. <laughs> and um, I had 77 categories of interest. It star art, aviation, automobiles, and right on through the whole alphabet. And uh, so I could pull out, you know, a drawer, review the information that I'd put there mentally, make some changes, stick it back in, and, and move on. We did this with music as well. I had a jukebox, and all the music that I, that I remembered and all the music that I learned from others and some who were shot down after I was had music I'd never heard. And so I added all these to, to my jukebox, and so I could punch, you know, um, A3, and there was Chet Atkins and, you know, anything. And so uh, I could sing. I, in the early days, 
I sang music to myself. Now, you, you were not allowed to, to sing out loud or make any noise out loud. So I sang with my hands as a sort of a megaphone going into my ear. And I could sing, and yet it wouldn't be heard. And so I had a huge uh, accumulation of music. Another thing I put into my mind, everything was mental. And somebody, one of the uh, students we spoke to yesterday at the Vietnam elective asked about my photographic memory. I said, I have a really crummy memory. <laughs> I had memorized by 1968 when the bombing stopped, I had memorized 350 names of other prisoners, all, all of them that were there that I knew of. Um, and I had them arranged uh, alphabetically. I had them arranged by rank, by airplane. Uh, I had to go over that list every single day. And I had all kinds of other things that were memorized. And I had to refresh that memory, you know, periodically or it was gone. I memorized every time I moved, every time I got a package or uh, wrote a letter or all that stuff. And when I got back, I did this giant data dump, you know, and just wiped my, all of that out so I could make room for more <laughs> stuff. But that's how we did it. Um, and so, again, uh, by living in the future, I was trying to sort of escape the, the difficult present. The third period was, I call the now, and that was when I stopped doing that. I had done the past, I'd done the future, and now the present was meaningful. And I concluded at the end of this period that we had meaningful lives there. We were doing meaningful things. We were learning. We were caring for each other. We had built a, a society that had every element of that society except for our true families. But we had become a family. We had become uh, a society. And so uh, <clears throat> I was comfortable in that present. And somebody had asked me how long were you prepared to stay there? I was prepared to stay there another 10 years or the rest of my life if it was necessary because I knew I had created a, a, a life that was meaningful to me and to others and that we had endured and that we could endure. Not that I didn't want to at all, but that was my attitude and that was the power of adaptation to uh, strange environments, that you can do it if you have the will to do it. And uh, <clears throat> so um, three reflections on, my, on all of this. The first thing, one, one thing when I first got there, number one, I determined I was gonna re eat everything. No matter how awful it was, I was going to eat everything. And I did that except for one dish, which we call fish crunchies. And it was dried fish. And if they were little fish, I could eat them, except for the eyeballs that turned into these hard little marbles. But occasionally we got bigger fish that had the bones you could not chew up. And it smelled like ammonia. That was the one thing I never, I could not eat. Uh, one of the uh, chapters in, in my book is called There's No Such Thing as a Rotten Banana. And we got plenty of bananas that were, they were pretty soft. <laughs> but I, they had more flavor than a regular banana. So. <laughs> and so um, I, I made a, uh, a decision at the very beginning that I was going to stay as healthy as I possibly could. And that meant eating everything because we weren't getting very much food. Some, we got, uh, if we got any protein at all, it would be in the form of a, 
a piece of pig fat about the size of my thumb that began with hair, skin, fat, and a tiny little bacon strip of meat, maybe. And a lot of guys pull the hair out, cut the skin off. I ate the whole thing. And one time I tried to calculate how many paintbrushes I could make out of all the hair I had eaten and how many footballs I could make out of the skin, you know. So eating everything was, was part of my survival plan. Um, staying active mentally, physically, spiritually was my key to life. And I tried to do that every day, divide my time up into those activities. A mental activity, of course, I was memorizing a hell of a lot of stuff, and so I had plenty of that, but we did other exercises as well. Physical, I've worked out to the extent of my environment and um, our diet. Uh, later on, I, I was with this wonderful wonderful group of nine of us. We called ourselves the Onagers. And I write about them, I write about the Onagers a lot. Um, and because uh, the Onager was a wild Asian ass, donkey kind of, you know. Uh, and it was also the name of a Roman siege engine. But we adopted that name, the Onagers. And so I write a lot about the Onagers because of the wonderful things that we did together. And uh, where was I going with this? Anyway, uh, <laughs> it was there where I, we made slide rules. Uh, we made learn to play guitar and the piano and all these kind of things. Because for the first time, you know, I'd been living with one other person or by myself for, uh, for these first few years. And now suddenly we were put in this group of nine and that changed everything, you know, because now you had so many resources in terms of what people knew and knew how to do and all of that. So it was really uh, a wonderful, a wonderful time. Um, so we, one of the things we did during that time, we had um, contests to do various uh, physical things. Uh, deep knee bends, uh, push-ups, and uh, sit-ups. And uh, two, of, two of us uh, in, in our cell, this was a camp-wide um, competition. So everybody was doing, that wanted to compete. And you would publish your, your, your scores for the day or whatever. And I know the guy that did uh, sit-ups he won with 3,000 sit-ups. Paid a great price on his backside for that. A um, friend of mine, Irv Williams, uh, won the push-up contest. How many people here have done 200 push-ups without, you know, nobody? Sure. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Irv Williams did 2,250 push-ups. I entered the deep knee bend contest, and uh, <clears throat> over time, uh, everybody dropped out except two of us, Bunny Tally and I, and uh, it got it, we got up into the, we'd do 1,000 and then do 2,000 and so on, and uh, in order to do these, when there was more than several thousand, the only time you could do that was at night after they closed the doors. And so you had all night. So that's what we were pulling these all-nighters. And we got up to 5,000. And finally I did 6,000. Bunny did 7,000. I was going to go for 10,000. But there's no way that you had time to do 10,000 deep knee bends because you had to start when the door closed and stop when it opened, and you could only do 7,000. So I let him have that record. <laughs> but uh, so we, you know, it was it was this effort to 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 stay in shape mentally, physically, and spiritually. We always had 
church, our church service on Sunday, the senior officer gave the sign or the signal for church call, which was CC. And then we all, if you could stand, you stood, faced whatever direction you thought the United States was, you said the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, Lord's Prayer, or whatever, you, and then your own service. And we did that no matter whether we were in small groups or larger groups or whatever. Every Sunday we had, we had uh, church service. Um, the next reflection is about choices. I mentioned the hardest choice I had to make about when I was moved in with Fred Cherry. And I suddenly, I realized then the choices we make are so important. Some people were not making the right choices. And I certainly realized in, throughout my life that I'd made some really crummy choices. But I realized that it was the choices we make determine the course of our lives. Not so much about what you have or you do not have, or what happens to you. It's your reaction to what happens to you, what you have or you don't have. And so it's your attitude is everything. You know, and this is something that we, probably most of us learned in our families, you know, about choosing correctly, about your attitude about life. And yet, this was imprinted on me that it was, we always had a choice. You saw how the Vietnamese could wrap us up. They could deny every single freedom that we had. And they did. But there was one they could never take away from us unless they killed us or drove you crazy. And that was the freedom to choose. Your free will. They could never take that away from you. And so the, probably people understand that anyway, but until it's dramatically brought home to you, it does not become a part of your being the way that it came. And so that was the first most important lesson that I learned in Hanoi was the freedom uh, to choose and how that determines our, our lives. And the third reflection is that I think that we figured out that we were searching for a meaningful life, even in the worst of circumstances. I had not read Viktor Frankl. Somebody gave me a copy of it when I came home and I read it. I said, oh, this explains everything, you know. So it was the realization that our fate was really in our, our own hands. It depended on how we reacted to our circumstances. And controlling your attitude is the hardest thing. It's fairly easy, you know, determining what you do or you don't do. But controlling your attitude about life, about how you react to tragedy or great success or anything in life, that's the key. That's the key to, to this whole thing. And so that's Victor Frankl, really. If you haven't read that, I, I, I really encourage you to do that. So I'm kind of thinking about three important things. Uh, and the first would be communications. I mentioned the tap code and, you know, various things about communications. But I think that we, we were very fortunate in that um, um, the number four POW to, to arrive, Smitty Harris, uh, Air Force officer, uh, brought in the idea of the TAP code. And he had learned that in SEER school, but not as part of the curriculum. It's just an aside, oh, by the way, uh, prisoners in World War II use this method to communicate from one cell, one, uh, cell block to another by tapping on water pipes that would carry that sound from one building to another. <clears throat> and so he, he kind of spread it around. We all started off in, in Heartbreak Hotel, which was a eight cell block 
uh, in, in the Hanoi Hilton, and uh, most of us, we learned the tap code there. I happened to see it. Uh, one of these cells was used as a washroom and place to dump your bucket. Uh, and I, when I looked down and there was a little symbol there that said, smile your own candid camera. <laughs> and so I looked and there's this cryptic uh, um, schematic of the tap code. So Dave Wheat and I, uh, he was next door to me, he was shot down the same day I was. Uh, we s kind of figured that out and started tapping and so on. And we were in a situation where in heartbreak, if uh, Dave was in cell number one, he could watch the door. And if the guards were not around, um, he gave the signal, it was all clear. And that was, uh, Mary had a little lamb, whistle. And if a guard was coming, he would whistle, uh, pop goes the weasel. So we had a little uh, way of clearing and, and so we could talk and so on. So we started, we learned a tap code and everything. And I'm, I, when I moved away from there, my, the person that I was next to was Jerry Denton who was, uh, he was um, going, he was an A4 uh, squadron commander scheduled to be CAG, uh, and he was shot down in the summer uh, from the Independence. I was on the USS Independence, and of course, uh, he had not heard any news about, you know, anything, and so I was able to give him a lot of information. But when we first started tapping, it was all gibberish. And it was because Dave and I got it wrong. You're supposed to do uh, the row first, the number of the row, one to five, and then the number of the column, which puts you in a particular cell of this, of this matrix. But we had gotten it backwards. So I had to, after all that work memorizing that, I had to go back and <laughs> do it again. And uh, so the tap code became uh, our, our salvation. It's what I said, you know, it allowed, it allowed leadership, it allowed fellowship, it, everything, everything depended on it. But um, it was almost unfortunate it was called the tap code because um, that meant tapping on the wall and tapping on the wall was like a person-to-person -person phone call. So if I wanted to give a message to the SRO, or the senior ranking guy in my cell block, and I was on one end and he was on the other, it meant that my message had to go through one, two, three, four walls to get there. And then a message coming back, you know, so it was cumbersome. After Fred and I uh, were split up uh, in the beginning of this terrible terrible time, um, I moved out to a prison called uh, the Briar Patch. And they sent all the bad guys out there. And uh, I, could only, I could only tap on the wall with one guy. Uh, these little cell blocks had four cells, uh, but due to the configuration and so on, I could only tap on the wall with one guy. And we spent, it, I mean, it was a terrible time. We spent all day, every day, with our hands handcuffed behind our back. And so in order to tap, I had to back up to the wall and tap with the end of my finger on the wall very lightly because the punishment for communications at this time, once the, you know, the, they changed their policy, was you got two days of heavy punishment followed by 60 days in a foxhole with your hands handcuffed behind your back. You got out once a day to use a bucket and eat one meal. So you think they were serious about stopping us from communicating? They were very serious. And so we were very serious about doing it. And so uh, my the guy on the other side of the wall was Major Howie Dunn, and he was a Marine uh, F-4 pilot. And uh, we went through really tough times and uh, tapping on the wall very lightly. 
uh, about everything that happened to us. Each time we went out for something, we'd come back and tell the other. Uh, he treated me uh, as, as an equal. Even though he was my senior officer and I looked to him for guidance, I mean, he, he had a lot more experience than I did. Eventually we started, because we had nothing else to do, we spent almost every waking moment that we could tapping on the wall to each other, uh, talking about our, our families, our military careers. His was long, mine was short. Uh, and, and experiences and what we liked and didn't like and all this. And we even came up with a way of passing the time at night. And we, uh, it was menu creation. And so one day it would be my time to plan the menus for the next day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, cocktails, hors d'oeuvres, everything. And so I, I could, you know, there's no electricity out there. And so it was completely dark at night. You're sitting there with nothing. And oh, we ate our meals in the dark. One first meal in the dark, last meal in the dark. You never knew what you were really eating. Uh, anyway, that's another story. But anyway, um, so you would tap, I would tap to Howie what breakfast was all about, and then we would do lunch and dinner and all this. And then the next day, it would be Howie's turn to do this. So it occupied our minds, and you had to be creative. You couldn't have steak and potatoes every day. You know, you need to have uh, a, a variety, and hopefully it would be something unusual and so on. So it would pass the time. And so Howie and I became pretty good friends. And I suddenly realized I'd never seen him because we never got out at the same time or anything. So I said, Howie, what do you look like anyway? And he said, uh, you know John Wayne? I said, yeah, I know John Wayne. He said a lot like that. Okay, this guy is a Marine. He's a fighter pilot. He's 6'2". Broad shoulders, narrow hips, rugged good looks. I put that mental image of Howie with everything else I knew about him. And we eventually uh, moved from that place because they were afraid of, afraid of a rescue attempt because they, we'd see 105s come over the camp slow and wiggling their wings, you know, saying hi and all that. Well, the Vietnamese saw that too. So they eventually moved us out of, out of the briar patch. So I never saw Howie again. Uh, there weren't very many Marines there. And um, so, and I didn't know, it, I never ran into anybody that knew him. And so uh, years later now, we're getting ready to come home and, and they're, you know, reading the, the uh, agreements to us and we're all out in the big uh, courtyard and so on. And I'm chatting with some friends and so on. And this guy comes up to me, a uh, total stranger. He was short and bald. <laughs> he sticks out his hand. He said, hi, I'm Howie Dunn. I said, Howie, you son of a bitch. You <laughs> lied to me. You lied to me. And he got a big smile on his face and said, I know, I know, but it was such fun knowing the image that you had of me all. But the only thing he had was rugged good looks. <laughs> so, you know, I, I love that story, but the, the point of it is, here in the instant that he said his name, how he done, he went from being a complete and absolute stranger to being one of my best friends in all my life. Numbers one to five. So that shows you the power of adequate of communication and why it is so important in all of your lives is to be excellent communicators with those that you deal with, whether it's your family, whether it's a church group, whether it's a city council, whether it's a military organization, no matter what it is, if you are to exert leadership, you need to master communication, good communication that goes both ways. 
And so that's, that's what's important about this story is that the method of communi communication is not so important as, as the effectiveness of it, of how it's used. So uh, sadly, uh, Howie has uh, passed away quite a few years ago, but I always remember that, that story. Well, the second thing is humor. Um, sometimes things got so bad, you just had to laugh and say, you know, can't get any worse than this. I had a, I had a friend, one of the guy I lived with the onagers, and he was, his name was Glenn Daigle, but he was from Louisiana, and uh, he went by Kunas. And Kunas is a, some kind of a Cajun. But anyway, he wanted to be called Kunas. So Kunas was a very unusual guy, great guy. And he used to say the un most unusual things like, you know, it's always darkest before it's totally black. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Irv Williams used to say, you know, well, if you couldn't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. <laughs> The uh, bit of humor, though, that I remember the most was my friend, uh, Mike Christian, who was uh, Irv Williams' backseater in a, uh, A6. He had been former enlisted. He was a little rough cut around the edges and so on. Uh, he hated the Vietnamese, and he let them know, as opposed to some other people who were a little more tactful about their interaction with the Vietnamese. I was one of those. I didn't want to unnecessarily bring, you know, additional punishment and so on. So I tried to be at least not belligerent. And, but Mike was different. Well, one time, I don't know, they took him out for some reason and he was gone for over a week and we could, they were taking other people out too and uh, we could hear their screams and uh, this horrible time. I mean, this was terrible. We were in this, in a group of uh, eight or nine. And you remember the, uh, the rope trick? Well, he finally comes back. They open the door. Oh, when they took him out, I knew they were gonna take somebody out. And uh, I had two very powerful emotions in a short period of time. And the first was, when they pointed at Mike and told him to roll up stuff, move out. And it was this great sense of relief that it wasn't me, because I knew he, what he was gonna go through. And the second emotion was a great sense of guilt that it was not me, that Mike was going to get hammered in my place. So he comes back and they open the door and there he is, he looked like hell. He had been through awful time. And they closed the door, we kind of gathered around him. And somebody said, Mike, where you been? What happened? I'll never forget, he gets this little smile on his face. He looked up, he said, I got tied up and couldn't get away. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, changed everything, you know, that little bit of humor and the display of his attitude about what had happened to him changed everything. And he was essentially saying, don't feel sorry for me and sure as hell don't feel sorry for yourselves. I'm back, I'm okay, forget about it, we'll move on. And that little bit of humor changed everything. And so I, I am so convinced that humor has to be a part of leadership. I quite often pass, ask people if they ever had a commanding officer that had no sense of humor, that they thought was an outstanding officer or leader. And very, very few times have I ever gotten a positive response. Because when you stop to think about it, all the great leaders have had a sense of humor. And I think humor is the thing, just like Mike Christian did, that can 
break, break a terrible situation, relieve that tension and fear and everything. If you can make light of something like that, then uh, that is real leadership. And so I think humor is a very, very important part of leadership. And I could tell you other stories uh, about that. But um, the third thing is uh, forgiveness. Um, about hatred, I've, I think, you know, it was, it was pretty easy to hate our captors for a variety of reasons. What they did to us, what they were doing to our families, what this whole war was about, about communism. Uh, we, <clears throat> we were racist and we treated them as subhuman because they treated us that way. They treated us as criminals. No rank, we didn't have rank. They took that away or they thought they did. Uh, and so we reacted by putting this barrier <laughs> between us with, with racial, racial attitudes. And we spoke of them as, uh, as subhuman. We call the prison the zoo because they kept the people inside and the animals outside. And so this hatred became useful. It built a barrier. It was like a suit of armor uh, they could never, these subhuman folks could never convince us of anything, uh, the, uh, the justness of their cause or the truth. You know, if they say they shot down 10 airplanes, they probably shot down one. So we figured out they're, you know, they were congenital liars about everything. They exaggerated everything. They had a big celebration when they claim they shot down 3,000 airplanes. That's more airplanes than we had in our entire inventory. So they exaggerated, they lied, you couldn't, so we, this hatred became this armor, this shield. And so at the very end, I had, uh, you know, I had my list of 77 things. I'd thought about the future. Uh, but I had not consulted with Marty about any of this, so <laughs> so a lot of these things never happened. But uh, <laughs> um, we were sitting around. We knew we were going home within a day, and uh, I was thinking about that picture, Marty and Dabney, and uh, being being back with them. My my mother and my grandparents had all died while I was gone, but uh, that's what I was thinking about, the future with my family. I overheard these two guys talking about how they were going to get revenge on the Vietnamese. And I suddenly realized what a powerful grip hatred had on them and maybe on me. So I realized that I could, I couldn't go home with, with hatred. And uh, so when we walked through the gates of the Hanoi Hilton for, I thought for the last time, it wasn't, but uh, I, I thought it was the last time. I just turned around to that building and I said, I forgive you. And all of that hatred, all of that armor fell away. And I walked out of two prisons because hatred is a prison, as are so many other things in our lives, that we lock ourselves in prisons of all kinds. And the sad thing is, we have the keys to those prisons right here. And so my two lessons, the greatest lessons that I learned, came together in that act. I chose to forgive. And so that was the important thing. The two greatest lessons came together. And that has changed my life, changed my attitude about life, about everything. Hatred is not in my life. And it's the most liberating thing that I have ever done. So I've done, um, I've done these things in threes. 
but I only read two poems. I read, I've written a lot of poems. I want to read you one which is uh, perhaps appropriately called The Three of Us. And it was after looking at this photograph of, of Marty and, and Dabney that uh, I began to think about uh, life with them. The Three of Us. Yesterday on meeting you, hoping without knowing you, knowing without asking you, loving without telling you. The young and misty two of us, sharing each the best of us, accepting to the worst of us, and we so good for both of us. And as for me, the faulty one, the wild and hungry, needy one, to spend my life in search of one and finding you the perfect one. And so we shared our pastel days, our soft and glowing magic days, and you with child within those days, and then our few but perfect days. Now two of you to wait for me to love, to hope, to pray for me, and I still feel you part of me, though you and she so far from me. The future still so bright for us, for you, for me, for three of us, and she the best of each of us will fill the lives of both of us. That was prophetic because she has. Oh, yeah. Here's your book. <laughs> Porter, thank you. It's spectacular. And I've asked Marty to please stand and be recognized. If you'd like to take your seats, we've got just a few minutes left for a few questions. I'll make note of the fact that uh, Reflections on Captivity, there are some copies of this book available both in the museum store and in the bookstore. And Porter's new book of poetry is available in the trunk of my car. <laughs> <laughs> are there any questions? If so, uh, raise your hand and, and use your microphone, speak up. please. And please speak up. My hearing is not uh, the best, and so... Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. I'm Lieutenant Commander Michael Murray, Information Officer. Oh, I'm not going to be officer. able to understand that. I'm sorry. John to translate. Translate for me. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, from my family and I, I like to thank you and your family for your service and sacrifice. Uh, during your captivity, I imagine your family went through their own form of suffering, uh, being that your wife is actually here, maybe this might be a better question addressed to her, but how did they feel about the support they received from the United States during your captivity, and how might that have been better? Um, you're going to have to help me with that. How, did, how do you believe Marty felt that the United States supported her and her family during your absence? Absolutely. Um, the Navy particularly was, uh, could not have been more helpful to her uh, I wish you had time to listen to her story uh, about that, but yes, they, they cared for her. As soon as, even when she was a widow, they still were checking up on her and all of that, making sure she was okay and helped her with various things. You know, remember a, a wife at the time in 1965, 66, couldn't uh, get a credit card or couldn't buy a car, couldn't sell a car, couldn't do anything, really without their husband's signature. And so they found ways around this and helped her in every way. And then after I was uh, found to be a prisoner of war, they were doubly helpful. And so they couldn't, the Navy could not have been better 
than, uh, than they were in helping her, helping us after I came home and so on. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. <clears throat> Other questions? Right there, please. Sir, Lieutenant Commander Brown, first of all, thank you. For us, not having gone through the type of crucible that you have, if we encounter someone that we know is going through a crisis, what is the best way that you recommend that we try and connect them and help them through that? Because ultimately they have to do it on their own. That's a, that's a difficult question if I understand it correctly, uh, and it lies outside of my area of expertise, I think. Um, but, you know, anyone that's going through a difficult time, no matter what it is, um, if they're doing it alone, it's, it's a terrible thing. If uh, they have people that they can rely on, people that they feel care about them, that even love them, uh, can offer simple advice and so on, I think that's, that's the best thing you can do to people who are hurting in one way or another, if I understand your question correctly, yes. Um, obviously, professional help is, uh, is, uh, is a good thing, but you know, on a personal basis, I think that kind of friendship in a time of need is one of the more important things you can do. Yeah. Porter, I'm going to preempt a question here. You said that most of the uh, fellow prisoners were officers, but uh, could you tell us about mm. uh, how the enlisted personnel reacted, uh, Doug Hegdahl in particular? Yeah, we, uh, uh, we, as I said, we were all pretty much commissioned officers, but there were uh, Air Force uh, helicopter crew, uh, two, of, two of them, so there were a few of those enlisted guys. <clears throat> but to me... <clears throat> the one I want to talk about that John mentioned is a Navy sailor. And he was on the cruiser Canberra out there in the South China Sea, and uh, somehow he fell overboard. We're not exactly sure what happened there, but he, <laughs> he fell overboard, and uh, nobody, it was at night, nobody saw him. Ship went on, and uh, he, pad he paddles around out there until morning, and... Uh, and uh, some Vietnamese fishermen find him and they bring him on board and turn him over to the military. And the military thinks maybe he's a CIA plant, that he's been intentionally tossed overboard to be put into our system and do nefarious things. That's giving the CIA a lot of credit, but... Uh, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, anyways, 19-year-old seaman. And uh, he soon convinced them that that's what he was. And uh, so he had a greater um, uh, freedom to move, move around because they thought he was just the dumbest, stupidest guy and could do no harm. And so they let him uh, roam around. He did things like he put sand in trucks, uh, gas tanks, and I mean, he did all kind of, I mean, he really was acting as, a, <laughs> as an agent. Um, he was put in with a guy named uh, Dick Stratton, who was a lieutenant commander and had been tortured, had knew all the names uh, we, you know, that we memorized. And at the time, uh, I think he had, Remember, this, this is before 68. Anyway, the Vietnamese came up with this idea that they would release some guys early for propaganda, you know, to show how humane they were and all of that. And so Doug was asked uh, if he would go home early. He said, hell no, I'll go home when everybody else does. He, in fact, was not a legal POW. He was a survivor at sea in terms of international law. And so he could have gone home early. Nobody would have said anything and so on. But he said, no, I'll go home when everybody else does. He moved in with, with uh, Stratton for some reason. I don't know. And Stratton realized that Doug had an amazing memory, a memory I wish I had. 
He could, memor- he could recite the Gettysburg Address from memory, forward and backwards. So he had that kind of memory. So Doug, Dick Stratton taught him all the names of 150 names that he had, uh, taught him everything about the ways that we communicated, uh, about all methods of torture, about everything about our captivity that he had never gone through. He had never gone through any of this. And ordered him, if you are given the opportunity to go home early, I order you to accept. And so the next group, he was asked again if he would, and he reluctantly agreed. And 15 minutes after he landed in the United States, he was on the telephone with Marty telling her information that I was not only there, but I was okay. And of course, she's been living in this uncertainty. Uncertainty is a terrible thing, you know. And so to hear that from Doug, you know, meant a great deal. Well, then Doug Hedgold was sent on a tour of SEER schools, Navy, Air Force, and so on. Completely revised their whole curriculum because now they were teaching uh, the tap code and other means of communication, uh, what we call the second line of resistance, which was our adaptation to how do you deal with torture. Everyone broke under torture. We found that no matter how tough you thought you were, you were going to break eventually because they knew how to inflict pain and terror What do you do then? Well, that's the second line of resistance. You learn how to resist in a different way rather than saying no. You learn to give them the finger, you give them to, you know, whatever it is you can do to resist and negate that document, whatever it is, uh, that's the second line of resistance. And that's the way that we, continued to adhere to the code of conduct. So Doug Hedgall changed everything by going around to all these seer schools. He became the director of one of them. He's a very humble man, a uh, very private man, but Doug Hedgall was one of the heroes uh, in our group and he was the lowest ranking. And so that, I hate to tell you this, I, am I taking up too much time? Um, I don't like to talk about this. We had people that made mistakes, people that realized they made mistakes and made changes. We had two traitors. And these were not junior officers that didn't know better. One was a Marine Lieutenant Colonel a squadron commander, F-4 squadron commander, the youngest lieutenant colonel in the Corps. The other was a Navy commander, also a squadron commander. These were traitors. I hate to say that, but it terrifies me that if these two guys had been shot down in 1965, instead of later, and Stockdale and Denton and Reisner were shot down later, or never shot down, and we had these two guys who collaborated with the enemy, who turned me in for communicating, what would this environment have been like? Maybe we would have been able to deal with this. Maybe we would have uh, rebelled. Maybe, I don't know what. But in a World War II situation, these guys would have been killed. The Marine went, uh, when he came back, went to work for Jane Fonda. 
The Navy commander uh, retired to a farm in Maryland. But I shudder to think if these guys, with their attitude, had been shot down early as Stockdale and Reisner and Denton were, what our environment was. So it's another lesson in, in um, leadership. I mean, here, are the, here are these two guys should have been sterling senior leaders, but they were traitors. And here you got somebody like this Navy seaman who was a hero. So anyway. Admiral? Well, sir, I, I, I think I speak for everyone for how much we've learned today from you and continue to learn and, and look forward to continuing the conversation about communication, about humor, mm. and about forgiveness, and most importantly, about the choice. Mm. So thank you yes, sir. for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes, Uh, this concludes the event, and uh, Professor Halliburton will be down front if you want to uh, say hello and shake hands. Thank you for coming.